What about lipid peroxidation? And what and what is this? And wh- and why does this come up? You know, when people are talking about seed oils. Yeah, it's a oxidative degradation of lipids in general. And I think the the reason it comes up is because it is true that unsaturated fats are more prone to oxidation, at least when they're isolated in a test tube. I don't think that's controversial, and it has to be to do with the double bonds. Now, the question is, does that pan out in the context of the oil, where there are other components? And then the main question is, does that pan out in a living, breathing human consuming the oil? So... I think those are all good questions. Uh, so we went through a couple of trials. There's a couple of trials in humans giving people canola oil, using, for example, saturated fat as a comparator, and then measuring oxidation products in bodily fluids. Uh, one of them is the, these category, this category of chemicals called isoprostanes, which are oxidation byproducts. They measure them in urine. They measure them in plasma. They used a couple of different techniques to satisfy themselves, and no significant increase in these products with exposure to canola, even when uh, it was used to cook. And then another product of lipid oxidation that people often ask about is 4-HNE. Pretty common to hear that. So we tried to look for that specifically, studies measuring that compound in canola oil, and it was undetectable with canola oil off the shelf and very low production, even after exposure to several hours of of heat. Uh, It might have to do with vitamin E, which is an antioxidant uh, that is pretty high in these seed oils. And that might be the reason to explain why they are prone to oxidation by themselves, but they seem more resistant in in the context of the oil. Another thing to to mention, and this is getting a little bit more into the weeds, but there is an an in vitro assay that in some trials indicates an increase in in oxidation products with exposure to canola, and it's called T-bars. And it's a pretty common assay to to find in papers. And it's it's basically a test tube or a kind of a lab plate assay where you run a reaction in the plate, and then you measure colorimetrically. And so there seemed to be, at first glance, this discrepancy between that, that in vitro assay and the in vivo data. And we dug more to see if we could figure out why, why that was. And we found a fair amount of literature in that field, like this, this pretty specialized, uh, nerdy literature going over the, the caveats of that assay. And it seems that it's just very nonspecific. So It's prone to artifacts. It picks up, it reacts with many molecules that are not uh, lipid oxidation products or even lipid related. It can react with carbohydrates, with amino acids, with uh, even DNA. So it's good and it's sensitive for preparations that are purified lipids, for example. But once you have a more complex mixture, like in a bodily food, like in urine or blood, where you have protein, you have cells, you have uh, carbohydrates in there. It just gives all kinds of uh, of signals. So it's been criticized in the literature. Now, happy to, to hear, to be contradicted by people who uh, run these trials for a living, if that's, if that's wrong in any way, but this is pretty consistently what we found. And with the relevant, I guess, human health outcomes here, be cardiovascular disease, are we coming back to that those meta-analyses of the long-term cohort studies that show a reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease? Yeah, I think I think oxidation you could tie to almost any disease. Uh, you could certainly tie to, uh, to cardiovascular. You could tie to diabetes. You could tie to cancer for sure. Uh, and we've, we, we found, we, we discussed in the video one, actually it's the same cohort study, the one with half a million people, uh, people cooking with canola seem to have lower cancer mortality than people cooking with butter. So it doesn't seem to compute there either that that it's just oxidating you to high heaven and turning you into a, a lump of coal. Uh, the other thing that's that's 
important to bear in mind in terms of big picture, which is what you're very uh, astutely getting to, is that these, these uh, inflammatory markers and the oxidation markers, these things are relevant, but we shouldn't miss uh, lose, lose track of the, uh, of the big picture because we know that, for example, with exercise, inflammatory markers go up acutely and lipid, lipid peroxidation can be induced by exercise. So we just have to be careful with the logical leaps. This molecule went up, therefore the intervention is, to, is, po is poison. Just a little bit of care, care, a little bit of caution, and look at the outcomes of people actually eating the food or performing the activity. Right, and it comes back to logical consistency, I guess. Again, you made that point earlier, but if if you're going to take the view that a mechanistic study that shows an increase in oxidation automatically means that this food is problematic and we should avoid exposure to it, then a similar similar logic is to look at exercise, as you just said, and acutely see an increase in oxidation and disregard all of the long-term data that shows exercise is associated with a reduction in risk of disease and take the position that we should not exercise. I think the key here is that we have to come up with a system that we are comfortable with, a heuristic system. So if your bar is that epidemiology doesn't count, as long as you're consistent with that across, if your bar is that you look at mechanisms and mechanisms trump outcomes, that's a strange bar. But if that's your bar, you have to be consistent with that across. The problem is doing this ad hoc and kind of gerrymandering data. I think a lot of times we see people working backwards. They decide first which foods they like or which foods they think are good and bad and which activities are good and bad. And then they try to back rationalize the data. And that's where we see all this inconsistency.